So the first I want to introduce is Chang Wang. Uh, he's a professor in Department of Industry of the System Engineering in University of South California, like good university in there. And he was just, uh, he just focused on artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning for manufacturing uh, and for adaptive manufacturing. He he has he received received a fellow from ASM ASM award and a fellow from the IISE and uh, award from uh, NSI Korea Award and uh, uh, 2021 IEEE Vice Conference Paper, uh, 2013 IEEE Transaction of Information Science and Engineering Vice uh, Paper. And he has five patents in machine learning for, for, for adaptive manufacturing. Uh, he has several. He is the uh, uh, associate editor of several transactions, ASME, and several. And another is general manufacturing and systems science and engineering. Okay, so we start this talk. Go ahead, Jiang. No, the first actually, uh, like uh, to thank Professor Liu for the kind uh, invitation and the introduction. I really enjoy. The IEP case conference you helped organize this summer, and also in like uh, Mexico, Mexico City very much. Yeah. Now, for the benefit of the audience, some of you may be wondering, uh, you know, how is control theory related to the 3D printing quality control? So I'll actually first actually introduce the 3D printing quality control problem, which we are very excited about in the past decade. And actually, to introduce how we gradually found it out that the control theory really helped actually develop innovative machine learning approach for the 3D printing quality control. Now, many of you probably know that 3D printing uh, is revolutionary manufacturing technology, can change the healthcare, you know, consumer, uh, you know, defense, a lot of industries, right? But the reality is actually 3D printing has a defect, has a quality problem. A major category of quality uh, problem we consider is uh, shape deviation. So when you print the product, for example, here, the simple example, the dash line represents a nominal, but when you print it out, uh, you know, the parts actually shrink or expanded differently at different places. Okay. Now, one intuitive idea you probably think well let's introduce some compensation right um like if it is shrink make it even bigger so when you print it out to the modify the design so it will be perfect right now uh, to implement this intuitive idea there is two main category problem we have to solve the first actually is we call the forward problem so let's see, actually, you printed out, observe this uh, deviation delta. Now we have to develop a model to predict, you know, for different product, what will be the delta, right? After you're able to do the prediction, you have to solve the inverse problem, say, actually, uh, based on the prediction, uh, you know, how actually we found the optimal amount of the adjustment. So actually, we can minimize the shape deviation. Now, the idea is intuitive, but it's really, really kind of like a difficult problem. So why? Because, uh, you know, the advantage of 3D printing is uh, so-called complex uh, free fabrication. Actually, you can produce really the product with the complicated geometry, right? However, uh, but the product space is the dimension actually infinite. You have all kinds of the geometries and the geometry impact on the, uh, the deformation. The more than that, uh, different product design the geometry has a different variation patterns. And even actually you have the same geometry when you increase the volume of size, the division pattern also changes because actually physical uh, you know, materials shrinkage uh, got involved. Now we also have the price, uh, the process complexity because 3D printing 
you probably know that actually the layer by layer fabrication process. There are so many different layers stacked up, and it's actually the stack up is not linear. Uh, you could actually have the different materials, actually the process the condition has been changed. Now, when you do the forward prediction problem, this is really, really a challenge. Now, what it makes things worse, actually, if you try to develop machine learning for 3D printing, is uh, the sample size, the data you have actually is limited because we use 3D printing actually to personalize our design and the product, right? So it's not a mass production. So one kind of design, you probably only have a few or one. So the, the data size actually is really limited. So that actually makes this problem extremely hard. Now, to give you some idea how the data looks like, right? So what kind of data we play with? So this is actually a so-called point cloud data. So it's saying that if you printed a product, for example, like in the dome, you use the laser scanner to scan the part of geometry every point on the surface, so you get X, Y, Z coordinates of the parts, eventually generate a really dense point cloud, right? Uh, it's small data. We uh, It's really saying that actually for one product, you only have a design, you only have one uh, print. Uh, but the, for each print, you actually have very large dense point cloud data. Now, the geometry could be very complicated. For example, people use sort of printing for dental application, right? So the, the geometry for dental model actually is really uh, complicated. Now, here just to show some simple example to to illustrate the point I just pointed out. Uh, the first point I said the different geometry, uh, you know, they have the different division patterns. So here, because it's uh, use the two D, uh, it's very easy to illustrate, right? So you can see actually for this, actually you have this division pattern. Polygon actually have completely different patterns, right? Now. As I said, you know, for even the same geometry, if actually you print it out vertically, layer by layer stack up, because the physical process now linear uh, mechanism involved, the division pattern actually uh, are different, even for the same geometry, right? It's, you know, for other, uh, it's also generally true for uh, 3D geometry in general. Now, if we kind of like finally develop, uh, Machine learning model to the prediction, uh, even the process actually condition changed a little bit. Okay, now even you have the same design, they actually have a completely different patterns, right? So, so the question would be, do I have to repeat everything, collect the data to relearn the model, or can actually we can have uh, innovative transfer learning approach with much less data to transfer the model from one process to another? Okay. Now, uh, in the past decade, actually, we tried to solve this uh, interesting problem. Uh, those actually a category of the problem, you know, we have done some work. For example, the forward prediction problem, the inverse, you know, op optimal composition problem. Once actually, you, you know, do the prediction, do the composition. Now you printed out the product. If it's not still perfect, how you further do the Bayesian learning to improve your model? The, uh, you know, the one interesting category of problem called the transfer learning. So you develop the model for one process. Now, how do you quickly transfer the model to a different process, right? We develop our engineering driven, we call the effective equivalence approach, actually use much less data to do the transfer learning. Not only computers actually have quite a large amount of data. Now, sometimes actually the possible actually we can, you know, develop the model to automatically uh, generate uh, the machine learning model. Okay. Now, now here for the uh, for this specific conference, really I want to uh, focus on is you know how the control theory actually help us develop really the new uh, machine learning approach. Now, at the beginning, we kind of like uh, intuitively developed the so-called convolutional learning framework for 3D printing. Now, eventually, recently, we found the rigorous proof. And also found it out actually provide new opportunity for us to develop a new approach. So our first actually introduce, you know, for us easy to understand, to introduce the intuitive solution first, then actually show more rigorous proof of why this intuitive solution is correct and what's the additional benefit. Now, now here this figure shows the intuitive illustration of the 3D printing process. 
this is a you know, cross-section view. Uh, it's a really three-dimensional case. Now in 3D printing, actually you step up the, you know, uh, the layer by layer to generate uh, you know, three-dimensional geometry. Each layer, you can control the geometry. That's why you can generate complicated uh, 3D shapes. Now, if we look at this uh, uh, figure, now a lot of people actually think, well, this is actually is similar like mathematical integration, right? You can like stack up, you know, small section of the area, then you can form it, you know, the, the shape of the 2D area or the three-dimensional wall. So uh, we initially we thought because we realized, you know, same geometry, for example, the door, right? When we stack up the layer, they have a different patterns. Uh, so it actually definitely is not a linear uh, stack up. So how we can, you know, use this intuitive concept, mathematical integration to describe this uh, through the printing process, that way actually we can uh, capture, you know, the nonlinear step up effect. Now, uh, the one idea is how I can use a convolution. So it introduces a function to so somehow to change the weight of the different layers, so actually you can change and uh, make it nonlinear, right? And also the additional advantage is, uh, you know, you use this, there's a possibility actually we can learn from 2D layer first, then uh, try to study how the, you know, now linearly add them together to, to generate the model. That actually could simplify the modeling process. Now, now essentially the saying that let's describe the sort of printing process use convolution formulation, right? So the function f here, this is represent a layer inputs, it's layer uh, by layer. Now the g is really kind of like a, uh, the function actually is say how to stack up together, right? Now, this is actually the first time we realize, uh, well, this actually is somehow maybe connected with the control theory. We know that, you, know, can, you all know a lot of experts in the conference, you know, state-based model is very generic representation if you solve the state space model, actually you got the convolution of four. So we realized, well, this is probably, uh, we propose this convolution formulation. This is actually important to say that you can use state space model to describe this state, uh, system. Uh, we did not use state space model because there's so many parameters get involved, it's really hard to, kind of like, uh, to get to learn each component, right? Then there's a final solution to try to describe use the convolution actually probably a lot more easy. Now, then if we actually we accept that actually we can use uh, convolution. Later on, we'll show actually why this is correct. We'll show the proof. Uh, so the, the few things actually we need to uh, kind of like answer the first. The first actually, what is y, right? In the model and what is the function f and what is the function g, right? The Y here is really represent the, the shape of deviation because we're interested actually to control the geometrical quality. So Y represent the deviation. How actually the, the actual print actually deviated from the design geometry. Uh, now how to represent Y actually is the tricky issue. Machine learning, the representation learning is very critical. We kind of like uh, our experience said actually the representation of the data really play a significant role. Uh, so what we do is kind of like you transfer the point cloud data. You already see, you already saw this actually uh, the data figure before. So we transfer the point cloud data to the deviation surfaces. Okay, so you kind of like present essentially saying that you present the data, the deviation data in a spherical coordinate system, for example. So that actually you generate the deviation surfaces. Now for uh, to the example, a simple case like there, you're saying let's present in a polar corner system. Essentially, you're saying that ideal case, there's no deviation, there's a straight line, zero line, right? Then you look at the different 360 degree at each location, you know, what is up and down. So actually you can get a deviation curve. So to summarize, 2D represent data in the deviation curve, now 3D extension simply just uh, deviation surfaces. So that actually data structure actually very make it a lot more easy for us actually uh, to in the machine learning. Uh, 
right? So here the example, for example, the division surfaces. Now, after we represent the data, the next thing actually let's uh, figure out what will be the function f, right? The function f, uh, because actually we have the convolution formulation. Now, we already know that the property of the convolution that, so if actually the function uh, g actually is the delta input, you do the convolution just a function f itself. Now, physically for a 3D printing process, what does that mean? Now, if it's actually the g function is the delta input, essentially you're saying actually you really just print uh, very thin layers, two dimensional layers. Now, with that understanding, we know that now that you can get, we can get a function f, and that's actually equivalent to the, the deviation, which actually, this is a deviation of the two dimensional layers. So that actually is going to be simplifying the problem. Essentially, what that this tell us is, let's learn the, three, uh, the two dimensional case layer first, then figure out how to actually get the three dimensional case. Okay. Now, now, even for the two dimensional case, actually, it's not a uh, trivial problem. Why? Because essentially, we're trying to see that, you know, for the two dimensional layers, you have the small set of the training data. Uh, you cannot exhaust all the different uh, two-dimensional shapes. That's infeasible. So uh, the problem would be actually how do you actually have the small set of the two-dimensional layers? You can predict the quality of the, any freeform, right? So actually, this is a really, really hard problem. Uh, now, again, we start this is the problem first. Uh, so we represent the data in the uh, polar coordinate system. The or idea at that time saying that, you know, because we have a small set of the data, the only way for us actually to generate one model for different geometry actually to study how the different the 2D geometry are connected. Okay. Now intuitively we can think about, okay, uh, if we actually uh, print a circular basis, any other geometry can be considered as, you know, cut out from the circular basis, like a cookie cutter, okay. Now, what that means is let's first actually study the circular basis because it's a really perfect geometry, a simple geometry can use as the basis functions. Then you figure out what are the quick cut of functions, you can generate other geometry, right? Now here I'll give you an example. Uh, I won't give a lot of details because of time limitation, uh, I'll just explain the ideas. So this actually, this is one model for uh, all the 2D geometries the layers, predict the quality. So here the function actually is just the model to predict actually a circular basis because it's very simple. That's why you can see actually a simple term there because it's a perfect circular shape, right? Uh, the other is a cookie cutter function. Essentially this is a square wave function that you can use also sawtooth functions to actually how to uh, the generate the model for the, for example, a square, square uh, shape. You can see actually that's one simple model. You can predict actually the data of the circular disk and also the uh, the polygon shape, right? Now we can extend this idea to to uh, predict the freeform. Why? Because the freeform you can think about it's actually constructed by the circular sector and also line segments. Okay, we learn the circular sector a lot of circular sector from the circular disk. And we learn the line segment from the polygon geometry. So that way actually we can segment, uh, you know, free form into a circular sector and a line segment. So, uh, and we actually we constructed the free form geometry. This is what we did before. Actually, we can extend it to a 2D free form. So now actually we got F, right? For the layer before this tech up. So next thing, let's figure out what will be the the, the function g in the convolution form. Now, what we know so far is we got the f, right? We know actually the deviation for the 3D geometry. We can print it a few actually to test it. So then we figure out the g is just a deconvolution problem, right? Now, we kind of like develop our own approach because actually we want to the model selection also considering what we have actually got for for the layer function f, okay? 
Now here, just a kind of like a simple example, I want to show you the results to how we identify uh, the G, function G actually eventually what will be a convolution formulation for that case. Or we'll skip some of the details, okay? Then want to show you uh, what is the advantage of the convolution formulation, okay? Now here we said actually we, Eventually, we use a deconvolution get a function g, then we convolve them together, f convolve them with g, we got this form, right? Now, we, when we look at this model and we decompose this actually, the convolution model into a few functional components, okay? Then we realize, okay, there are three components, right? And these three components have a different property. And the first component actually, you, you found that actually, this actually really capture how the layer interaction interacts with each other. Now, the last components represent, uh, really strongly correlated with the input, but the layer deviation, you know, what type of deviation pattern you have really impact on this component. The second component actually, we hypothesize actually, this could be due to gravity effect. Now, because this is a polymer, if you look at the magnitude of the function, it's really small. But when you, when you investigate the matter basis 3D printing, actually that component could be uh, very, very strong. Okay. So now actually we not only have the machine learning model, actually we can get the understanding about the different components that actually provide opportunity for process improvement. Now here, just a little bit technical details, we further improve uh, uh, the, uh, the models you know, considering the spatial correlation. Okay. Now, uh, this is another example we studied, uh, kind of like do the prediction for a three-dimensional case that actually have the same uh, phenomena. We can see actually this capture how the, you know, the layer stack up together and this actually relates to the input, this actually relates to the gravity effect. Now, uh, what we did before is actually we first consider these the dome geometry. Then we consider you know some surface with planar surface, uh, you know somehow they could represent the cube and other surfaces, right? Uh, then the question for us again is actually how we learn them together, right? Now. We extended what we have done for cookie cutter. Remember previously when we studied 2D, it was actually the, the cookie cutter function getting involved. Now this actually idea can extend into 3D case as well. Essentially we're trying to say, let's suppose we use the dome as the basis of geometry, right? The other 3D actually you can consider actually call out from the basis of geometry. So that way we can simplify the modeling learning process. Now essentially, what does that mean? Well, that means actually mathematically, uh, I can decompose the 3D printing process into two steps. The first step I call the attitude step. I build the basis of geometry like, like the dome, spherical geometry as my base geometry. The second actually is the subtractive step. So I can generate my mathematical function to carve out the other geometry from that basis of geometry. Now, what that means is simply just saying that, you know, you, we can do one plus one equals to the two. I can also do three minus one equals to two. As long as I think actually three minus one actually provide a lot of convenience actually for my machine learning model. So that is essentially what we're doing here. Uh, now still, uh, we use uh, our uh, convolution formulation put a different geometry into one model, okay? Uh, then we extended the cookie cutter function from 2D to three-dimensional case to, gen to mimic the additive step and the subtractive step, okay? Uh, there's other little bit of complicated issue because I have the heterogeneous geometry, how you learn the different data together, I will skip some of the details. Now, eventually, actually, we just one model convolution form plus the cookie cutter function to actually one model to the prediction per different geometry variable. Okay. Now, quickly, uh, 
I want to actually talk a little, touch on a little bit about the optimal compensation, right? So once actually we kind of like able to predict actually the geometrical quality, then we actually, as I mentioned at the beginning, we need to do the compensation, okay? Now essentially what you're trying to say that once you have the predictor model, when you do the compensation here, you adjust the original design, then you, this is a new design input, you predict the quality, right? So the problem to try to solve is how actually we can calculate this adjustment to minimize the output deviation. So actually we have the analytical solution. Actually, we have a pattern on this. There are a lot of citation from industry from company. So this is actually our analytical solution. This solution says that here, this is represent your know, the amount of the deviation you predicted from the machine learning model or from the element model. So the, this is the optimal amount of the adjustment you have. So this represented the deviation gradient. Now essentially what it says that if the deviation gradient actually is the same everywhere, so you can just use, you know, the shrinkage effect approach. You have, a, you know, one unit of the expansion, you just use, make the adjustment to one unit of the shrinkage of the design. So that will be optimal. But in most of the cases, actually, the deviation gradient actually is not uniform. So that's why actually the common practice of the shrinkage factor, this is op not an optimal solution. So we have the done this test uh, for different uh, three different process prediction and the optimal compensation, right? For SLA, for metal, uh, for FDM, and the wire arc manufacturing, you know, very popular right now for the space industry. Uh, so actually the tests are pretty successful. Now, so far what we talk about is, okay, we intuitively present this convolutional learning framework. Uh, actually, this actually works pretty well, okay? Now, there's a remaining issue. Uh, there's two remaining issues, however. Um, how we can have a theoretical proof to validate that the convolutional formulation is really, uh, like, can it make sense mathematically? The second major issue is I show that actually for 3D cases, I use the dome perfect geometry and also the other irregular, now smooth geometry. Uh, you know, we can do the prediction. However, it does not show that actually I can use that uh, uh, machine learning framework to predict any of uh, the free shape, free form shapes, right? So does that pre kind of like a provide the path actually uh, for any uh, free form? So that's actually our recent work, actually try to address these issues, uh, then also extend our understanding of 3D printing actually even further. Now here, this actually, this actually how we the, kind of like prove this uh, uh, approach, why does the intuitive solution could be correct, okay? The first thing we realize uh, in 3D printing, let's say you printed a, a circle uh, you know, one layer, even actually the design is perfect circle, but the reality is that input to the 3D printer is not the perfect, you know, the circle of the sector. Why? Because all this digitalized is stepwise approximation, okay? To approximate actually the perfect geometry, okay? Uh, this actually common practice in in digital manufacturing. Now, for a 3D geometry, it's also kind of like the slices are discretized, actually it's layer by layer, okay? You know, the boundary can actually is also kind of like, uh, is not a smooth, it's really an approximation. So this actually realized, this is actually a uh, true input to the 3D printing process, okay? Uh, all the smooth boundary actually is the piecewise linear approximation. Now, the one intuitive concept, as actually we learned from the past, is you know we actually can use the segment, circular sector or line segment. Okay. Um, then when we realize uh, all the manufacturing input actually discretized, uh, and also kind of like a piecewise approximation, so we can use a few basic elements, 
for example, the line segments and the circular sector and the corners to predict any 2D geometry. And you can extend it to three-dimensional case and use those the basic elements uh, to approximate a freeform, right? So now what essentially we're trying to trying to suggest in here is those are the basic uh, elements, we call them manufacturing primitives, is really the new geometry uh, for 3D printing. So let's forget about the common geometry defined, like say circle or you know square. Let's look at those basic input. This is really our geometry, right? Now this is actually this is a way to do the dimension reduction. Otherwise, you have to handle you know infinite dimension in the three-dimensional space. Now, so the first with this primitive, actually we can you know approximate for any 2D or the freeform, right? Still the output, you know, for 2D, uh, the response I will represent as the curve, the 3D I represent at the surfaces. Uh, so next step actually how I model those uh, primitive inputs. The primitive inputs I'm trying to say here is those line segments, sort of linear approximation and the circular sector and the polymers, right? And also uh, 3D. Now, now here it actually comes from like a true theory, okay? because you can first actually look at the simple case for the 2D. So those, uh, the input actually kind of like a piecewise constant input, right? This is, you can think about this actually just exactly the same as the summation of the step input uh, in signal processing. And here this is output. Output actually because of the curve, because I represented the quality as the division curve, now essentially we're saying that we have step uh, inputs and it was the output is the division curve. So the perfect actually, the control theory use impulse uh, response actually to describe this uh, relationship. Now, even I have the 3D printing have the, you know, described the design, but because actually I can do the piecewise approximation, is exact to me, this is no difference, you know, in the signal process because of the input is just uh, stepwise, uh, the constant. Output is just a curve in the signal, right? So they can, we can perfectly borrow this case, use uh, impulse response formulations to describe this primitive input. So you already know that actually this is a really end up with convolution, right? Now for 3D, this is just an extension uh, to the two, you know, high dimensional case, we can model the 3D primitives. Now, now what then this is to suggest that, okay, once actually we can model, you know, the, the local uh, discretized inputs, we can put them together so we can approximate the 2D and the three dimensional geometry, three form, okay? Now, we also prove that you know, before we propose a very key important component in our model is uh, the cookie cutter, cookie cutter functions, right? Now here, kind of like uh, uh, the cookie cutter function, actually we we have that just because actually we have this corner input, right? We have the corners. Now we can also prove actually why actually the cookie cutter function actually the works and how we can further improve improve the machine learning model. So this actually end up, uh, you know, more general form with a convolution form and also cook the other functions. We can integrate them together and prove actually what, why we have done before that's correct. Okay. All right. Now, now, other than we can now finally through the, the dimension reduction, uh, we can extend our convolutional framework and do the prediction of learning for 3D and your freeform geometry with a little set of the data. Uh, with the control theory, we already know that, uh, you know, impulse response formulation, actually, we can use that actually to generate transfer function to characterize 3D printing process, is that right? So you already know that actually, you know, we have this form, conversion form, so we can calculate, uh, generate transfer function. 
Now here, I'll give you an example we have done before. So, so transfer function, for example, for the, the disk, this is actually how this 3D printing process transform the input, the circle, into the division curves, right? You can think about the generator signal. Once you have the input of the disk, here generate the division curve equivalent to the signal. Now here, the cookie harder function actually will also generate uh, the transfer function describe, you know, when you produce the caller, how they generate a different set of the signals. And essentially, actually, we can uh, somehow try to use this to get to the insight how the 3D printing process works. Use this to characterize 3D printing process, right? Another thing actually interesting, actually, we can also borrow the block diagram representation of the, you know, from the control theory and use that actually to describe uh, my sort of the dynamics of my 3D printing system, right? I can also design the feedback control loop to see actually how to do the compensation. Now here, I'll give you an example to see uh, how we generate, for example, uh, the feedback and the adjustment, what would, you know, for the block diagram. Now here, I kind of like to give a quickly sum summary of what we have uh, done for 3D printing quality control. Essentially, uh, we use uh, control theory actually help us actually to develop and design new machine learning approach for engineering application. In this case, actually, 3D printing quality control. Now, uh, the, the enabling step for us actually able to do that is actually first we do the process in form of the dimension reduction because we consider what is the true input of 3D printing. We use the primitive the rather than geometry uh, to describe this uh, manufacturing input. Then make it possible not only for dimension reduction but also for the control theory to prove that. Okay. And this actually provides a new opportunity for control the theoretical modeling and the learning for engineer application, and to provide the interpretable machine learning and the control approach for engineer applications. Now, here the what other kind of like. Uh, uh, how this actually we can help and impact for the 3D printing. So we actually develop the uh, prototype a server. Uh, so you have the different user, for example, purpose that you have the printer at home, for example, uh, he has his own design printed out, then scan the product, have the, the data. You actually have the account in our system, so we can tell you actually how to uh, make an adjustment. So a lot of users do not have the knowledge about, uh, you know, the model and control the, for the 3D printing, and also do not know actually what exactly the process the condition. Now through this uh, machine learning approach, actually we can help to improve the system. Lastly, I want to thank my current and previous PhD students and the postdocs, and also. Uh, thank my collaborator and funding support from the uh, agencies. Yeah. All right, I think uh, uh, only talked about the uh, quarter minutes. I think less. Thank you for your uh, attention. Okay, thank you, thank you, Tian. Is uh, so we have twenty minutes, a lot of time, and um, for question and uh, comment. So I think if you are online, you can raise your hand, and if you're on site, you can. Question? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. I was okay. right, right in there. Um, the first question is about the, uh, these words, um, uh, things in, in a possible uh, solution that brings um some some plastic some plastic at different um cakes uh I, I think this uh because I, I was thinking in 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 the formulas that we can use uh the Lebesgue uh an analysis uh for for having another um type of 
equations that help us to to do more uh, and and maybe we can um, go deeper if we use that kind of of maths the integral the 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 how do you say the Lebesgue integral we we can analyze work with this uh, tools. I don't know if there's a word that uses that for analyzing this topic. Um, not sure I fully captured your question. <laughs> Do you um, mind? Yeah, it? yeah. yeah, I just wanted to know if there's a word that uses the Lebesgue integral to analyze these kind of words. The Lebesgue integral. I, I don't know if that is. I don't know if some, there's something. Um, if you know something about the Lebesgue integral, maybe we can use it for. Uh, oh, that's yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, but let me actually just repeat. Actually, you're saying that there is a special type of um, smart integral could actually improve the analysis of this kind of uh, this uh, our approach. Is that exactly your question, right? Yeah, I want to. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, definitely. I, I think actually uh, right now what uh, our focus is develop this the new expression and uh, approach, the platform. So there's many other kind of like uh, the mathematical control theory can be applied. I, I do see actually there are plenty of opportunity. Yes, you're definitely correct. Yeah. Now you have some idea, feel free to email. Yeah, No, but you maybe actually uh, went so fast. I uh, I skip a lot of the technical details. <laughs> you have a lot of time left. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, conclusion. Uh, so so uh, I think you 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 regard this your three D print uh, printing process can be a uh, convolution formulation or no? something like this one and uh, in deep learning we have another famous model we call it convolution neural network here and no? so yeah. is there some some possible i don't know is uh, to apply some result from cn to your your your, your you say the convolution formulation of 3d printing or else there's there some relation so that's a very interesting question. Uh, the the answer actually, I so far quick answer actually, I don't know the the connection yet. Uh, so so far at this stage, our convolution formulation is really just a mathematical convolution, right? Uh, the deep learning convolution actually use uh, the convolution like the filter to process the image. Now this is neural network how to actually you know that actually with the connected or expression uh, so far. Um, I don't know. Yeah, how actually to build that connection? I don't know. Uh, the quick comment is actually in the control theory of machine learning, we found a lot. For example, that uh, reinforced learning really closely connected with the control theory, right? So maybe actually we spend some more time to dig deeper into this field, eventually figure out the potential some connection. But at this stage. Uh, it's really early stage actually we present this uh, modern framework. There's many open questions actually for us actually to investigate. Yeah. Okay. We will continue this control theory because I, I see is that if you use convolution formulation and after you use Laplace transformation and you can transfer from time domain to frequent domain and your convolution become product. Okay. Yeah. So, but it's, uh, and then you can use the transfer function, huh? but the transfer function is for linear system and you have to use the impulsive response. And the, the, the question is linear system. No? So, so how to assure your 3D printing or your, 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 your process is linear or you, you make some, some, okay. some uh, yeah, very, very good questions. Very good question. Um, now, first, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 
you know, the three layer stack up is not the linear linearly stack up, right? So as you correctly pointed out, you know, they actually have a strong interaction. So that's why I kind of like the way you introduce the convolution, actually the kind of to introduce the weight, somehow to capture the is not just a simply this is a summation, you know, one plus one, right? This is the first thing. The second actually make it is complicated in 3D printing uh, is there is a very strong effect actually between uh, the neighborhood. Okay, and so we uh, here I did not have a time to introduce. So the convolution formation actually captures the main deviation trend. Okay, so on top of that, actually there are high order deviation, you know, getting involved. So what we do right now is use spatial statistics, the Gaussian process to capture that. Um, but we did not find the perfect solution actually how to integrate in the convolution actually. I have a 2D, I have the spatial correlation, you know, as the two points, two segments, for example. Once I introduce the, you know, layer stack up the convolution, now how actually I can also use that to capture the high order term, okay? Uh, so the high order term actually really make it actually really not just a thing, even actually we use linear system, actually the high order that we also introduce makes it really highly nonlinear. Okay. Uh, so there's, yes, you are correct, actually there's uh, there's some a few other issues actually we need further to improve this formulation. Some questions um, online? Yeah, yeah, or you can write down your with the chat. Yeah, let's continue. <laughs> Some general problems. Uh, general question is uh, my question is like this one. How do you find, for example, for all of the young researchers, we want to find some academic problem from real industry problem. For example, for 3D printing, you found this problem and you say, okay, you can use some tool, mathematic tool, we call convolution formulation and solve it. But my question is, how do you find this one? How do you find this problem? I mean, the, the relation between your 3D printing and the convolution formulation. I think if, if you transfer this one to convolution uh, formulation, we have a lot of tools, we have a lot of mathematics, we can use control theory, we can use a trans like your block, uh, block diagram, the transfer function, all of this we can use. But the first step, how to find this, how, how do you find this one? Okay. Professor, you really gave to the hardest question. I don't have a general kind of like uh, formula uh, to answer that question, but the only thing actually I can share is actually, uh, how we got this uh, stage so far, right? Maybe I can share with uh, you know future student actually, you know, how the problem started actually, how we reached it so far. Now the, the problem that she started is my colleague asked me. Uh, he actually draw on the board saying actually he's expert, um, Professor Chen, uh, my colleague, he's expert in 3D printing. He's actually I put, let's suppose actually a simple case I printed the disk, it's a shrinking expand and now uniformly, right? Can you help me actually to kind of like solve the problem? Actually, this is a simple question I asked 10 years ago. I really was drawn into it, okay? Uh, it's take about almost eight years to, you know, for us to realize actually we have, a, you know, convolution formulation and control theory. This is such a long process. Uh, what we have done is first actually we try to understand, even actually this is a simple geometry, we try to understand really can we actually uh, have a nice solution for that? This is the first. Second, when he asked me the question about the disk, I was thinking at that time, well, we have the different geometry. Uh, what, uh, when I propose the solution, is that possible actually I can solve all the problems? Okay, so kind of like extend actually what the question has been asked to see actually how we can generalize that is a step. Uh, then, once we actually solve the 2D problem, we say actually how we actually extend it uh, to the three-dimensional case. And when we extend it to uh, 3D cases, actually uh, they're consistent 
with what we have done before. So I don't want to give up all we have done. So actually, can I actually find a more generic framework? I can in, you know, include both. So that actually what were our consideration at that time. So you can see that actually is, that actually related to what I proposed for the conversion because I want to see actually how the 2D connected to the 3D, right? So but that time actually we don't know actually the conversion formulation yet. But the, the thinking at that time was actually I want to make it a connection. How what would be the proper mathematical form for me to make the connection? Okay, this is a procedure and the process actually for me to search for this solution. Um, then once we realize there is a possible way actually use you know, the convolution to describe the 3D printing process. So our question next question would be that well this is seems nice for simple geometry. Uh, how actually we can extend it to any freeform geometry, right? So that's also what the thinking process. Then we found it out, okay. We use this is a primitive as basis as a construction of units. Uh, then we try that, we can realize, wow, this is actually basic units, uh, you know, can be uh, modeled as impulse response formulation. So then the eventually actually re, uh, get this step. So this is really a long process. Um, I don't have the perfect solution, but this is how we actually we got here so far. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So some questions? Yeah. In in your opinion, what is the future on 3D printing, 3D printing technology? And what do companies like Stratas, HP, and Honeywell want to do uh, for uh, in domestic applications or industrial applications? Uh, because there are some distance, actually, it's a noise. Yeah. I mean, in your opinion, what is, do you, do you hear me? In your opinion, what is the future of 3D uh, uh, or of 3D technology? No. Oh. What do companies like Stratasys, HP, and Honeywell, which uh, are collaborating with you, uh, want to do for domestic applications or industrial applications or uh, bio biomedical? Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's also a tough question to predict the future. Uh, so there are a few things actually you uh, kind of like uh, I can think of, you know, broad perspective. Uh, recent, you know, I pointed out, you know, there is why arc attitude of manufacturing, uh, you know, use combine the welding and the robotics together uh, to build the largest structures. Then they really provide exciting opportunity for oil industry and also for space applications, right? So let's say it's actually, you know, through the space exploration, uh, I do think actually this is exciting uh, applications. Uh, you probably know actually there are a lot of healthcare application for personalized, uh, you know, the product uh, processes, for example, there is a lot of application as well, and including dental. Uh, so uh, eventually, I think the, for the future for 3D printing, you know, my personal view actually is really make the personalized, customized, application make it possible at an affordable co uh, cost. Even for space application, you can think about this as a specialized, customized application. You want to build some product at a lower cost with higher quality, right? So that's actually, I think that's probably the future, uh, how the 3D printing can play a major role. Okay? Really individualized, customized, not only for person, but the specific uh, applications. Now, for our collaboration with HPR Stratasys, um, we're trying to do something is how do you design a tested artifact? Uh, you know, build once, uh, don't build a lot of product, so you can generate the machine learning model so they can calibrate the machine, right? So this is actually the big application because a lot of test artifacts have been designed but for a specific purpose. You know, for us, once you actually build a few, generate a machine learning model, you can calibrate the correct compensate to your the machine. I'm not sure I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Chiang, and uh, see you next time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you know, for your time, attention. Uh, hopefully, actually, I can I can see you some of you in Mexico City. I really like the city. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <Yeah>. Okay. I <laughs> like my you.
Sí, sí.
Ah, sí, ya. ¿Ya? Sí, ah, pero porque es la emisión, ¿no? No, no, no. Porque no, está no, ahí. No. ¿Pero está ahí? Este, no, no está ahí. Pues ahí dice que está. Sí, ¿verdad? Ah, es que yo soy. A ver, espera. Entonces, por eso ahora sí entré, porque usted la inició. Pero nosotros creo que no podemos iniciarla, entonces. <risa> Estoy en la anterior, no voy a salir. Ah, sí, esta es la anterior, sí es cierto. 